Hello everybody, my name is Koba, and welcome back to Satisfactory. Now today we're going to be taking a look at fluids in Satisfactory once again, and we're going to be looking at a few different properties of both fluids and their supporting structures so we can get a better sense of how they work and how you can use these. Now we're going to be doing a couple of different tests. We're going to take a look at VIP junctions or how we can create a priority junction that will favor one pipeline over another. We're also going to be taking a look at how sloshing works, some of the issues with valves, and then Finally, we're going to take all of these things and put them together to see how we can maximize flow rate through a Mark II pipeline in the context of a power plant. Now, a lot of this is inspired by other users, especially a user named Megalian, who's put together an excellent PDF on the subject. So I'll post a link to that so you can check it out, but also countless others. And I'll find any reference materials that I can and post them in the description for you to take a look at. So what we have here are eight fluid buffers on this side and four on the far side. The four on the far side are all empty and are awaiting fluids, the eight on this side are all full. And what we have here are four different sort of pipe orientations or structures so that we can see how they work. Now, how priority junctions in Satisfactory seem to work is through pressure or work pressure. And so what we have are on this first one, we don't have anything. We're using some valves that are just sort of left wide open. We're not altering flow rate in any way, but what we're going to do is simply connect this up to our far pipeline. And again, that valve is left wide open and we are going to see which of these tanks the water flows out of in order to fill our buffer on the far side. Now the valves are in place in order to prevent any sort of backflow to make sure that any fluid that comes out of this buffer after it passes through that valve, nothing else is going back in. Same on the other side and same here. So nothing is gonna drain out of this last fluid buffer, but we're not using the valves to alter flow in any way. And that's probably important. We'll talk about valves here in just a little bit because they have some really weird properties that we need to get into. Now in this next one, this is a VIP junction. This is essentially intended to prioritize the lower input here. And my intuition about why this works is that because the fluid in the second tank needs to travel upward, it's going to be working at a lower pressure when it enters the pipe network. And that means that it's going to sort of yield or give way to the fluid coming in the lower pipe network. Now this third one is flat, but on this one, we're using a pump to generate additional head lift on one side, which seems to also generate additional pressure. And so on this one, I would also expect the first tank to be the higher priority. In our third one, again, we are going to have the downward drop before moving up and upward before moving down. And again, I would expect in this one, the lower entrance to be a higher priority based on the intuition of pressure. So let's go ahead and connect these up and let them run for a little bit and see. All right, the destination buffers have all filled. Let's go ahead and take a look at where our leading pipes are at. And I've been setting up another test in the background because there's something else I want to test. So on our first one, which we don't have any sort of priority junction, we can see that we got almost perfect flow between the two buffers. They split it as evenly as you could have. And so there you go. This is not a priority system whatsoever. This is simply two pipes contributing, but we have managed to fill this last buffer completely. Now over on this one, we can see that the lower input pipe has successfully been the priority. We used looks like 360 to 370 units of water, and we are seeing a little bit of sloshing here between this first pipe and this fluid buffer. So we'll talk a little bit more about sloshing here in a minute, because I think that actually comes into play with a couple of different things comes into play with flow rates more than anything else. And I think the intuition here is that because this has a vertical line, when it goes to enter the pipeline, it's entering at a lower pressure. And so the bottom pipe gets prioritized. And so this is called a VIP junction. Now, one of the interesting things is that a pump seems to increase the pressure of a pipe similar to how it increases head lift. And so in this case, I would expect this tank to be empty. And yes, it is. And the other tank to be very nearly full. So that worked fine. And over here again, we would expect the bottom entrance pipe to be lower. And that one is nearly empty and the top entering buffer is nearly full. So this is how you do a priority junction. And if you want it to be neat, the pipeline trick, the, now the pump does need to be powered. That is something else I'll want to test here in a minute. So let's actually run a couple more tests here, one with an unpowered pump. And then there's one more test I want to play around with here. All right, I've set up a couple more tests over here, and these are things I wanna try playing around with pressure. So on this one, we're using an unpowered pump. So we see that there's no power there. It should still prevent backflow, but it should no longer provide any additional pressure or head lift. So I would expect if pressure works the way I intuit it to, that this would be very similar to our first test where they should flow evenly. And again, both of our tanks 
are at full capacity. Let's go ahead and set those up and let's place a valve to prevent backflow out of that final tank. And we should start to see the water flow in there and we'll see how it is draining out of these tanks. So far, it appears to be more or less even. All right, our other test here is we have a tank that is full and then a tank that is not quite full. We're only at about 75% capacity here. And what I'm testing here is does the amount of fluid in the tank affect how much pressure it has? Because if it does, I would expect this buffer to drain more and for these to end up either equal or this one to be the priority sort of drainage tool for this. So before we connect this one up, we'll go ahead and place our valve right there. And let's go ahead and test that one as well. Again, we have the valve that's limiting backflow out of our tank. All right, so our first test is complete. So these two buffers have ended up very nearly the same. So in this case, we can see that an unpowered pump works exactly the same as a valve in this testing scenario. And so it is in fact the powered pump over here that was doing the work of prioritizing the system. So it would appear that a pump can be used to prioritize a pipeline when it comes to input. And on our second test over here, we see something very interesting. It would appear that the more full tank has almost completely drained and the less full tank drained some, but not very much. So it does appear that the more full of fluid buffer is, the higher its starting pressure is. Now we're also seeing a little bit of sloshing here. So there's some exchange going on with the pipes there, but it shouldn't be very much. But that is another interesting result there. So pressure does seem to be affected by the amount of fluid that is sitting in a buffer as well. All right, next up, I wanna talk about sloshing and valves because I think those are going to be relevant to the discussion once we get over to look at our power plant here in a minute. And I wanted to discuss sloshing. So I actually built this testing area last night. So it's been running for about 12 hours. And we have this fluid buffer here that is continuing to slosh 12 hours later. How I built this was I set up one tank, I filled it completely, and then I set up an empty tank next to it and connected them with pipes. And what we can see is that even 12 hours later, the water seems to drain out significantly down to about 70 cubic meters. And then at that point, the other tank is mostly full and then the water sloshes back into the first tank. And so it's just sort of doing this oscillation back and forth between these two tanks. And this has been going forever. Now out of curiosity, I also set up one with industrial buffers and a gas, and that one still is sloshing, but it's at a much lower rate. We're only seeing a variance of about 70 cubic meters. For the most part, it is much more stable. So I think that this is perhaps something that's only with the liquid fluids and not so much with the gas fluids, but that is something to make a note of. I'm also not sure if the industrial fluid buffer has an effect on that. So that might be some place for further testing. All right, now I don't use valves for very much and I wanna highlight why that is. So what I have over here is a magic machine. This comes from a mod, it's just produces whatever. And here we're producing 1200 units a minute of rocket fuel. Obviously this is a Mark II pipeline, so we can only move 600 units of that, but it is successfully working and it's going into a magic sink, which is just destroying it. The idea here is that we wanna create this pipeline that has this flow rate on it, because I wanna show you guys one of the major limitations of valves. Now I mentioned before, I don't use valves very often and that's because valves seem to use a seven bit number or more likely a signed eight bit number to control their precision with how much fluid they can allow to flow through. So effectively how I use valves is only either to completely block flow by setting them to zero or to leave them completely open because they can't accurately represent different flow rates other than that. If you try and set a flow rate on a valve, it's not going to be what you can expect. And we can demonstrate this. Before we do this, I wanna highlight something here. We go into our calculator and type in 600, which is what our range of expected values on the valve is, and divide that by 1.28, we get approximately 4.7. And this seems to be the value that valves can adjust to. So we can have zero, we can have 4.7, we can have 9.4, we can have 14.1, and so on, but nothing except those values. Those are the discrete values that a pipeline valve can be allowed to flow through. And so what we can do, for example, if we set this to zero, we get zero. If we set it to one, we do not see a flow rate of one appear. If we set it to two, we do not see a flow rate of two appear. And what it's doing is it's rounding to those discrete values. So one and two round to zero rather than rounding up to 4.7, but three 
will round to 4.7. So if we set our valve limit to three, what we'll actually see is 4.7 goes through. And again, we can do this with any number. And what we're gonna see is we're always getting a multiple of this 4.6875 in terms of our flow rate. So seven, for example, is still closer to 4.7 than it is to 9.4. So we have our flow rate value set to seven, but we're only seeing 4.7 units flow through the valve. If we set it to eight, this should round up to 9.4 instead. And so the effect of this is that valves as a flow limiting tool have some really weird behaviors that make them very unreliable. You need to sort of know this math if you want to try and find a flow rate that they can do correctly. And I can't intuit the ratio between 128 and 600 well enough that I simply don't use valves in that way. I set them to prevent backflow or to completely close or open a pipeline, but setting them to something like 120 you're not gonna see a flow rate of 120, you're going to see the nearest adjustment to that value, which might be lower or higher than what you expect it to be. And the reason that matters is because this can create sloshing. What this would mean, if we set this in front of a fluid producing, a normal fluid producing structure, that doesn't just sort of magically and automatically constantly create fluids, is that if a machine that is consuming fluid shuts off for a second, then the fluid that's flowing into that machine is going to back up and that backup is going to propagate backward through the pipeline in the same way that a traffic jam can propagate backwards down the highway. And when it reaches the fluid producing structure, the oil extractor, for example, then that will cause the oil extractor to pause for a second while that clears up. But the result of that pause is that now we'll have a low point in the flow of fluids moving forward. And when that flow point reaches the machine again, it will cause the fluid consuming machine to be underfed for a minute and shut down and that fluid to start backing up and propagate backwards to the producer again. And so what we have here is this sloshing effect that goes back and forth and causes both the consumers and producers to flicker off back and forth. And there seems to be a few ways to prevent this from negatively affecting your system. First off, you need to make sure your inputs and outputs match precisely. And second, we need to make sure that fluids have as much flexibility as possible in their pipelines in order to continue working. All right, and so translating that into an actual build, what we have here is a simple fuel power plant with 10 generators that are all overclocked to 200%. So we're consuming 400 units of fuel a minute. And then we have 10 refineries that should be producing 400 units of fuel a minute and consuming 600 units of crude and then an oil extractor down here that is producing the crude oil for it. Now, what I have done is I've created a hydro structure here, and I can't take credit for this design. I saw this in a YouTube video back in like update four, and it has always worked for me. And so I want to explain my intuition about how it works so that you guys can use it if it makes sense for you. But this is how I maximize my flow rate through pipes. And essentially what we have here is the oil extractor is pumping 600 units of fluid per minute. If we have that in a long pipeline, then we're going to start to see, start to have an increased risk of sloshing. And so what we do is we immediately go into a vertical raise using the pressure and head lift from the oil extractor itself. And then our very first thing is to divide it into two parallel pipelines. Now these two parallel pipelines both have something on them to prevent backflow. And so that can be valves that are set to be wide open if you are doing this flat but you can also use pumps. In this case, I'm using the pumps to generate the head lift to move them up to our refineries, but something that will prevent any sort of backflow. And then we also need our fluid to be consumed at precisely the rate our extractor is drawing from it. And again, that comes into play because if one of these structures shuts down for a minute, that will create a bubble in the system that can propagate backwards and mess up the oil extractor for just a second, but enough that it would then create this sloshing, this sort of shockwave that would continue to cycle over and over again and lead to instability in the system. And so by doing this way, we ensure that the only part of the pipe network that actually needs to be perfectly full all the time is this one section here. Everything else we can divide up and we'll, we'll see that we, we see about 300 units of fluid going down. Interesting. We have 600 units of flow there, 300 there, zero here. 300 there. I think this is just bugged. I think this pipeline is simply not correct, showing correctly. And so what we can see is that the fluid coming out of the extractor itself is at 600, 
but once we move up into our parallel pipes, they are both running at about 300, and they, they seem to fluctuate back and forth which one is moving more, but ultimately they go up, they feed some machines, and then they reconnect at the end, so we run the two pipelines in parallel. Now this isn't that different than saying if we had all 10 of our machines in a row and just had the second pipe loop all the way around to the back. It's the same kind of structure, it's just sort of folded over in half right here. But the idea is, again, that we are not trying to maintain the correct flow rate and pressure all the way along a buffer, because as these machines sort of finish their production task and fluid flows in and then stops, it will create a sort of natural sloshing effect within this little pipe. And we want the overall pipe to be able to have space to accommodate that. Now this has been running for many hours and you can see that we have a perfectly stable power grid and perfectly stable power draw from our oil extractor so this appears to be stable and again the structure which I call the Hydra and has the sort of first pipeline raise up and then split immediately seems to be the magic ticket to making that work and then also ensuring that our inputs and our outputs match precisely. Anyways hopefully you guys have found this useful if you have ideas I got a lot of great feedback on the last part of this series, so if you guys would have other testing you want me to do or a specific problem you want me to try out and play around with, see if we can crack it, let me know, and I would be happy to do additional testing or play around with it. So thank you guys again for watching. Hopefully you have found this guide to fluids and priority buffers and valves and flow rates helpful. Leave a like if you have and subscribe if you would like to see more. My name is Dakoba and I hope you have an epic day. I will see you soon.